Good evening and welcome to Tisky Sour. Tonight I am delighted to be joined by Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities and candidate to be the next Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, Dawn Butler. Whoop, whoop. Thank you Hi. for coming into the studio. It's a pleasure. What a lovely studio. It's I, really, I'm I loving know. it. I'm loving the space. Uh, that's that's down to trend. you guys. Very on trend. All of you that go to support <laughs> on the borrowmedia.com and donate one, one, one hour's wage a month. It's very reasonable, that demand, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's nice. It's nice. And it's lovely. I've also got Aaron Bastani in the building. I do. Uh, I'm very well. Good. Delighted. This is our first deputy leadership candidate who's, who's, who's come to the studio. Yeah, we, we're hoping to get them all. Okay, but you've got great. in there first. Got in there first. It's me. Um, which I think means that people should, you know, put money on, on Dawn Butler because she's now done the Navarra Media appearance at I a see. crucial time in the race. Coming in first. Let's make sure I come in first on the race. Yeah. See what I did there? I mean, did you like that? No, <laughs> no I do like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's been a bit of a struggle so far, hasn't it? I mean, it in has. the sense that, you know, you had to... It, it was. It, it took a while to get the, the required MP nominations. Mm -hmm. Now the big unions, I mean, have, seem to have all gone for Angela Rayner, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Richard Bergen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you surprised by how tough it's been to get into the final round when it will be members that vote? Um, do you know what I'm surprised about? I'm surprised that I was surprised. Do you mm, know what I mean? Okay. Like I should have actually have expected it to be a struggle because everything that I've ever done has been a struggle. And, you know, being a black woman, you've always got to work twice as hard just to be recognized. And, um, and I was just like, Dawn, why did you think that it was going to be easy or just people were just going to accept the fact that, you know, your experience and mm. you should be on the ballot. And so I was, I, I was almost disappointed with myself that I allowed myself to believe that it would be easier than it was. Do you think that comes into it, you being a black woman? Because, I mean, you were, you were an officer for GMB, weren't you? And they've gone for a different candidate and you know do you, yeah, is that your analysis of what's happened that's still happened, quite or? painful I'm not sure I'm yeah. ready to talk about that yet okay that's fine <laughs> Uh, you, 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 you still are on track to get into the next round though, right? Absolutely. Because you've got 12 CLP nominations, you need another 21 but I mm. think you know less than a quarter of the CLPs have, have met up to now so mm. So it's, it's looking good. As long as, as, long as, as, long as everybody's out there just goes and, you know, stands up and says, yes, we want to see Dawn on the ballot. And we deserve to have a debate, right? Why should we have a coronation? We should have a debate. You know, we should have a debate. We should have different voices heard. You know, we should have people with different lived experiences heard. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't never neglect, you know, any form of our base. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm, I want to make sure we're on the ballot. And I do think it's important that we have diversity on the ballot too, you know. And, uh, you know. Let's talk about the nature of the debate we're having. So one of the reasons this debate is so intense in the leadership and the deputy leadership mm. race is because we lost an election or the Labour Party lost an election. Yeah. What's your analysis? Why did it happen? What went wrong? Uh, well, Aaron's the uh, analytical one, right? No, you're no, gonna, no. no you're gonna, gonna, our gonna, audience hear him all the time. You're going to cr crunch all the numbers. No, I'm not. No, no, and no. And you're going to say like, okay, and then in this area no, no. there was a this percent swing, and I mean there were there are a number of reasons, and I think there's lots of people that have to take some responsibility for the loss. Um, you know, there's certain things that that grate on me, and one of those is the coup, and. Without that coup in 2017, we would have won the election. I'm mm -hmm. pretty much sure of it. People were like, oh, if we had two more weeks, we would have won the election. Well, if we didn't have an effing coup, we would have won the election mm. anyway. So in 2017, in 2017, 2017. Mean, yeah. so that really annoys me. And I think that we need to take lessons from that. And I think that, you know, there's rumors of, you know, people doing that again. And so like, let's take those lessons and let's be united in the labor vision to move forward because we have to be united to fight the Tories. The Tories are our opponents. They're our enemies, not inside the party. So what are the lessons you're going to draw from that? Because I mean, all, all, all the leadership candidates, I think all the deputy leadership candidates as well have said, you know, we need unity. We need to be more united as a party. Mm -hmm. But obviously that's quite easy to say. Yeah, but, you exactly. Know, they're there, talking the talk, but have they actually walked yeah, the walk? It's a meaningless thing to say, right? And yeah. there are already some MPs who are briefing that if one candidate wins the leadership, Rebecca Long-Bailey, they might you know, start rebelling again or even leaving the party. So, mm. so if you see, I mean, say, I mean, let's be clear, it is most likely if Rebecca Long Bailey wins because we know that she's the person with, you know, the, the most opposition within the PLP. Mm -hmm. If there is a situation like there was when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, what would you do as deputy if you were deputy? Well, well number one, how selfish is that again? I mean, those MPs are so selfish, you know, to think that you're in that Westminster bubble and you can afford to talk like, well, okay, oh. if... 
Rebecca wins, and Rebecca's great, by the way, she's fantastic. I'll happily serve as her deputy. You know, if Rebecca wins, you know, we're going to resign or step down. You know, that is so selfish. But under my watch as deputy, what I want to make, ensure is that if you're not talking about getting Labour in government, that you're suspended. So you would literally suspend an MP if they go on Sky News and say the leader of the Labour Party is rubbish. I don't want them to be the next prime minister. Well, I mean, they never. They often did actually go almost as close as saying I don't want them. Oh, to they be did. The next lots minister, of people they? did. They said, you know, we 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 don't think you know Jeremy should be in number ten, and and there you go. He's not in number ten, and we also lost we also lost seats, and the Tories now have an eighty majority. You know, what do you think is going to happen if you go on TV saying to people don't vote Labour? Mm. You know, you know, we should be advocating people voting for Labour. Because a Labour government, in any guise, is way better than a Tory government. So you think MPs going on TV to trash the Labour Party out, bringing the party into disrepute, gone, suspended? Yes. That's a bold move. That is a bold move. Are you the first deputy leadership candidate to announce that? I am very bold. And I'm determined that we're going to win. I am preparing us for power. And that means you have to take it seriously. I've got a strategy. I've got a core campaign. C-O-R-E. This is my pitch. Go yeah, on. yeah, go on. Read yeah. it out. C O R E campaign. Yeah. Organize, recruit, and educate. We campaign on all levels from the bottom up. Yep. Grassroots movement organization. We organize proper organizations. Having tech that works for a start would help. Uh, making sure that you have organizers in each of the areas, rural towns, cities, everywhere. Recruit, we recruit as we go along, as people, mm-hmm. as we build trust in people, and we educate. We have a full educational program that can go out across all the nations whenever people want it in CLPs. And that's my core strategy. That's the winning plan. I think you've, you should add a D, cord. Cord. Discipline. Iron discipline. It seems yeah. like, you know, because it sounds like you're going yeah, well, to keep people in line this time we around. Have to be, you know, we have to be serious. You know, we have to be a government in waiting. And that means that we take ourselves seriously, we take our policies seriously, and we act like we're a government in waiting. And that means that we do have to be disciplined and united. Do you see the Tories going on TV, oh. trashing each other? No. Because and they, when they did, they kicked them out, didn't they? Yeah. Exactly. Because they know what's at stake. So that's, you know, you're going to have to get with the programme or hit the curb. Was Jeremy Corbyn too nice? Yeah, I mean, God, he just doesn't do, like... Honestly, I try it. PMQs, right? Sometimes... Are you trying to act so, him up? You're like, yeah, come yeah, on, so, Jeremy! Sometimes I'm like, say that, Jeremy, say that! <laughs> and he won't do it. And, uh, and, you know, occasionally I might even write it on the top of the paper, like, you know, say... He, well, not he's a liar, because he always says, do you know we can't call him a liar? But, you know, it's just like... So he doesn't really do personal attacks. Can you and, not call him a liar? No, you can't. It's... Um, it's uh, Unparliamentary yeah, language. Unparliamentary language, So what's, yeah. what's the limit of... What's the nastiest thing you can call so, Boris uh, You could say he's misled the House. Oh. Yeah, I know. But you can libel him as well, because you've got parliamentary privilege, right? So yeah. you could say, well, you actually, you could say, well, but after, you know, before being thrown out, mm. you can say, how many children do you have? You can repeat all these things. Mm. Yeah. That a journalist well, can't do. Yeah, you can. I mean, he's never going to tell us. I mean, what, what amazes me, though, what, what does, <laughs> what amazes me, where are the women? How come the women are so quiet, though, who's, who has these children? I mean, it's, do you know what I, mean? I, I find that quite his amazing. His wife, because, no, his but, ex-wife now. No, but I can't believe that he's n- nice to them. So I'm actually because quite... Because he's got his own strategy, N-D-A. <laughs> 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 I've actually got no idea. Maybe he doesn't have non-disclosure agreements. So it must, I mean, I've got it has, no idea. It has to maybe be, he does. Maybe he does. It was a joke. It was Marina, a joke. Marina Wheeler. That's it. His ex-wife, Marina Wheeler. Actually, probably still his wife, right? Technically, they're not divorced. I don't think they they've are. They've got four yeah, kids, yeah, five yeah. kids, uh-huh. with these like weird names. Yeah. You can call your kids what you like, yeah. obviously, but they're kind of weird names. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, no. I mean, I, I don't know. But I have to to take my shoe off and throw it. And I said, I can, I can be thrown out of Parliament for doing that. It's okay. I don't mind. Get the, Get the mace. Get the mace, hand yeah, it over yeah, to Jeremy. Yeah. Like Lloyd, Lloyd Russell Moyle. Yeah, but he did it. It was so um, polite, wasn't it? It was like he politely... You would have swung it around a bit <laughs> more. <laughs> Got in, you know, not a chat with it. Do you know what I mean? Make, like, make the most of the pointy you know, gold yeah, end. You know, like make, make a statement. You know what I mean? uh, you're watching Tisky Sour. You're watching <laughs> Navarra Media. As you know, this show, this organisation is only possible because of your kind support. Um, and even though I was joking when I said that Boris Johnson's ex-partners have signed NDAs, if I wasn't, I would need some money for legal advice. <laughs> but I don't because I was joking. Well, allegedly, allegedly, but allegedly in front of everyone. Yeah, go, go to support.navaramedia.com and give us the equivalent of one hour's wage a month and subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, because, you know, we're putting out shows all the time now and, and you want to make sure you get a reminder when they come out so you don't miss a minute. Um, let's talk about some other issues that came up in the election and that have been blamed for Labour's loss. So Brexit and, and the position of, 
of a people's vote. Mm -hmm. I think you were a backer of a people's vote. Mm -hmm. You're also kind of a, a hardcore Remainer in a way. You resigned in 2017, I think, mm -hmm. so that you could rebel and vote against the triggering of Article 50. Mm -hmm. and, I you, think, and the thing is you, this, okay, go we were never ready to trigger Article 50. And we said, look, if you're gonna trigger Article 50, let's have some parameters around that. Do you know what I mean like is there going to be a timeline? You know, so that we're not, so we wouldn't get into the mess and the rigmarole that we got into. We weren't, we're not ready to trigger Article Fifty. Then we needed to say, right, okay, this is what needs to be happened: mm. A, B, C, D. No, you just trigger it. It's all up in mid. They triggered it before there was a strategy, yeah, right? Was or before no, there was a negotiating no, strategy for the government. There was no strategy at all. It was just like, okay, we trigger Article Fifty, and then what? I mean, it made no sense. So was that a pra you? Would you say that you rebelled on that one, not because you wanted to stop Brexit, but because you wanted the government to have a negotiating strategy before they triggered Article 50? I mean, I didn't want Brexit, but I also want a strategy. I really am a pragmatic individual. Do you know what I mean? I used to be a computer programmer. I like things to make sense. I didn't know and that. I, do you not know that? No. Yeah, I like things to make sense and I like things to work. I was like, that isn't going to work. Um, I could see it wasn't going to work. So, yeah. And also my constituents wanted me to vote against Article 50. And we are constituency MPs and we need to take our constituents seriously. I had a, I had a consultation and it's like, right, okay, we don't want that. And so unfortunately, you know, I spoke to Jeremy, but we did it very quietly. So we did it at, I was giving away a bit of secrets now, but, um, oh, but we, we, did, we did it like, we did it at the, at the core time when the media was focusing on something C -O -R -E. else. C-O-R-E. C-O-R-E. Sorry. <laughs> I'm ruining the what exclusive is it, what is it, now. What does it stand for? Uh, campaign, co campaign, organize, uh, recruit, recruit, educate, 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 discipline, discipline, cord. cord. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Tell us about you voting against. I'm bringing cord in the dead of night. Uh, just in that as well, I'm bringing corduroy back into fashion. Can I just say I've got this really big, thick corduroy coat that I'm wearing around and you know, everywhere mm. I go in Scotland. I'm just letting you all know that. But I'm bringing, I'm personally bringing corduroy back into fashion. Anyway, where were we? Uh, <laughs> you, when you rebelled. Against oh, yeah, triggering Article 50, you did yeah. it yeah, yeah. in a sort of low-key way. No, you were yeah, telling yeah. us about... Oh, yeah. So we did it at a time where the media would be distracted, so it wouldn't, you know, so it wouldn't be a big deal, all the headlines. What would so happen? Like a, a Prince Andrew exclusive or something? Oh, we could never do, I could never do the Pizza Express kind of thing. <laughs> it was... Uh, <laughs> we, we were, I mean, that was mad. Do you think it was I a mean, it's dodgy, isn't it? Do you think it was a mistake back in Article 50? No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do you think it was a mistake going for a people's vote? In retrospect, now that you've seen sort of the electoral problems that Labour faced in the Red Wall? No, I think the mistake was we took too long to make any decision and each decision we came to, we didn't have message discipline around that decision. So it was a mess. And so we lost votes to people who voted Remain and we lost votes to people who voted Leave. I think if we had just a straight position and everyone was talking from the same hymn sheet, then people would have made like an informed decision and we wouldn't have lost so many votes. But was that ever possible? Because you had, I mean, what we've been told from people formerly in the shadow cabinet was there was a line and that certain colleagues of yours who were not name, one of them was running for the leadership you know, position. Another one was John McDonnell, just to make it not look like a partisan point, were constantly going the beyond- same party. Pardon? Partisan, but no, no, but no, I don't, yeah. a, 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 a yeah. factional yeah. Yeah. point. Factual. Mm -hmm. And they were constantly kind of undermining the, the kind of line that you were meant to be sharing on a second referendum. So for instance, apparently Keir Starmer in 2018 told conference unilaterally, remain or still be an option in any second referendum that hadn't been agreed. So I mean, on the one hand, yes, any sort of tight position would have been better than what Labour ended up with. But wasn't that kind of inevitable? Because you did have a small core of people who were hell bent on having a second referendum come hell or yeah, but, high water. But do you know what? So I've got um, a, a mixed heritage black guy working for me, right? He's from Leeds and he voted to leave. Right. And he's extremely intelligent, so he knew exactly what he was voting for. Mm. Um, he's definitely not racist. Um, so we would have these debates in the office all the time, every time I wrote a Brexit letter. And the thing is this, at the end of three and a half years, when we hadn't made any decision and we were going round and round in circles and yeah. Parliament was doing nothing, he was like, you know what, we need to do something now. Mm. And actually, he conceded that uh, another referendum... It's the way to go. But what were the options? So just putting remain on the paper was almost a slap in the face to some people. Because like we, they were like, we didn't want remain, we voted to leave. Mm. So we had to give more leave options in order to say that we're taking the vote seriously. And I think that's one of the mistakes that we had. So we, I think we should have had, um, we should have uh, had no deal. On the ballot. On the ballot. 
we should have had a negotiated deal, mm. a new negotiated deal, and we should have had a, the current deal. And I think that's how we should have spoken about it. And I think we would have built a bit more trust in, in people um, as we, as we that sold never, that I mean, forward. Even, forward. even if that hypothetically would have worked, you had this huge impetus going into the conference just a few months ago in 2019 mm. saying, not only does Labour have to have a position on a second referendum, not only does Remain have to be an option, but we're going to be a Remain party. Mm -hmm. And so there but, was that core of people who, who, regardless of the facts, were always going to try and end yeah. up at that point, weren't they? But I think that was because we campaigned during the referendum as a Remain party. Mm. And we never actually shifted our position. So there was no, um, there was no deliberate shift in our position. I mean, we didn't become a Leave party. No, in 2017, we were, we were Labour still, said it would... We were, we were still a Remain party. So, but what it is, is, you know, we lost the referendum. And so we needed to then adjust but, I mean, to, 2017, what we, to, what, to what we did next. Labour was very much, we accept the result of the referendum party. Mm -hmm. By 2019, it wasn't that anymore, was it? No, but, okay. So by triggering Article 50 mm. was an act of respect in the referendum. Mm. Because by triggering Article 50, you said, we're going to give this a chance. We're going to see if we can leave the European Union. That was respecting the referendum. You know, so, so, that, so Labour did respect the referendum by triggering Article 50 and giving it a go. But it, three and a half years yeah. of not making any headway at all, something I, else I totally needed to be done. But do you not think Labour's then paid the price for that? And that was because the Tories couldn't get a deal through because it didn't have a majority, but now Labour's paid the price for that, not the Tories. Oh, we have paid the price. I mean, it, it was, you know, a, a lot was to do with Brexit. And mm. of course we have paid the price. And so now what we have to do, say, right, how do we move forward? Because Boris now has to deliver Brexit. Mm. The, the uh, withdrawal uh, agreement bill is now in the statute books. Yeah. And so now he has to do the job. He said it was oven ready. Uh, the oven is hot. Let's see what he does. Do you think Labour really misjudged the sentiment of the nation? Because today you've got YouGov poll coming out saying Le uh, Tories polling 49%. Brexit's in three days. I mean, six months ago, people... And I, I know problems are obviously down the road, right? The, the can's been kicked down the road. But if you ask somebody six months ago, three days ahead of Britain leaving the European Union, what would the Tories be polling? Nobody would have said 49%. Why, well, no, but why not? I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, no, I disagree. At the end of the day, he said he was going to get Brexit done. It's now a bill. Of course, they're going to be on, it could be on a high, but, but no, but the whole, there's no action. Labour's whole pitch all, was it's all, it's all the country's divided, I'm, people are angry, there's this huge animus against Brexit, but actually the Tories are polling the highest they have Bob, since the late 80s. you must have been 80s. Bob as well. We're all Bob, right? We're all bored of Brexit, right? Yeah. We're all mm. Bobs. Everyone no, was, I agree with that. Everyone was bored of Brexit. Mm. So, you know, in a way, people are kind of letting a collective sigh of relief saying, okay, look, this is going to happen now. Um, and so they think it's going to happen, but you, you've got to wait until after the 31st of January. And then you so Labour's and then you position was wrong then, wasn't it? If, 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 if basically 50, if half the country basically... I can't like, believe we're talking so much about Brexit. Well, we're almost going to be done now. Oh but my if, God, if, this, is like, this is a real it's, Brexit it's debate. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of Brexit and you Brexit. still want me to talk about I hate, Brexit. I hated Brexit last year. You know what I mean? It's like, anyway, oh my God. You, it's, it's one thing to be like, oh, the country hates Brexit and all of a sudden the Tories are basically polling 50% three days ahead of Brexit. But we didn't, look, we, we obviously... I was part of the problem. I was saying, I didn't realise actually how kind of much the electorate doesn't really care. They kind of just want to get it over the with. We obviously didn't get it right. Otherwise, we'd be number 10. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we obviously didn't get it right. But Johnson ain't going to get it right either. So we just have to be a thorn in his side every step of the way. Because at the end of the day, we have to protect people, mm. their jobs, their services, their working conditions, the environment, you know, our security. All of that has to be protected. And we're the ones that are going to have to be the thorn in the side to remind Johnson every step of the way that we want those protections on our statute books. Because at the end of the day, he's going to try and undercut all of that. We're going to move on from Brexit. <laughs> yes! Uh, and we are going to, uh, you know, mark the occasion of moving on from Brexit by looking at some of Dawn Butler's best bits uh, in the media over the last few years. I mean, we'll, we'll use it as an opportunity to talk about how you have found the media over the last four years mm -hmm. and what your strategy would be to deal with them. Before we go to that clip, um, what we've started doing on this show is in the description, if you're watching this live, you can, or even if you're watching it afterwards, we've got the tweet which, which has the link to this show. If you've got Twitter, go to that, retweet it now, and that will mean more people come and watch this show. Because, you know, we always, we need to get the message out. Sounds like a plan. Um, At Dawn Butler Brent. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you even retweet, you've got to retweet, you'll retweet it when we're looking at your videos with Kay Burley. Are we ready for that clip now? This, uh, the, the context here is that this was in the 2015 leadership race. 
Um, you'd nominated Andy Burnham, Kay Burley. I, I nominated, no, no, you nominated no, no, Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn. I'm more confusing Kay yeah. Burley now. <laughs> you nominated Jeremy Corbyn, but you were backing Andy Burnham and Kay Burley was struggling to understand what the mm. hell was going on. Mm-hmm. I don't think that Jeremy will win. Um, I nominated that Jeremy. That was my question with respect. Yes, but I'm answering. Uh, no, you're not. So my question I'm is, sa- no, no, my question is, do you want him to win? Yeah, well, and I'm, I'm, and I'm going to answer you, Kay. Just calm down. So what I'm saying is, I nominated Jeremy. I'm happy that I nominated him. I don't think he will win. The person that I'd like to win would be Andy. Do you want him to win? I'd like Andy Burnham to win. Because I think Andy is the leader that we need to take the party forward and to actually unite the party. So I'd like Andy Burnham to win. So what was the point in voting for Jeremy Corbyn to be on the ballot paper in the first place? Because, as I said right at the beginning, it was our responsibilities as MPs to make sure we had the widest possible debate as possible. It was only MPs that were nominating the candidates. So it was up to MPs to say, OK, these are the people that we have to choose from as a party. And I think it's important. Jeremy has an important role to play within the Labour Party and make sure that we define who we are. And Jeremy has a pivotal role in that. And he is doing an amazing job in making sure that we have a debate covering all aspects of the Labour Party. And what he's doing is he's making sure that we don't forget our past as a Labour Party, but we redefine and make sure we secure our brand, if you like, as a party. And I respect Jeremy 100%. What's the point of putting somebody on the ballot paper if you don't want them to win? Oh, should I repeat myself? OK. Tony Blair doesn't agree, and neither, it would seem, does Yvette Cooper, who says that she wouldn't be in, his shadow, in her shadow cabinet. OK, well, that's Tony Blair and Yvette Cooper, but Andy says that Jeremy would be welcome in his shadow no, he cabinet. Didn't. So, no, he didn't. He said so, he would certainly not have him as Chancellor, shadow Chancellor. But he said, he, he said, Andy Burnham said that he would have Jeremy in his shadow cabinet. Don't tell me that he didn't say it because he, said, he did. He said, What's wrong with you? <laughs> he said on he the said telly, he said, he said on the telly on Sunday uh, on the Andrew Neil programme that he wouldn't have him as the shadow chancellor. OK, so you might not have him as a shadow chancellor. But, Kay, there are other positions. Do you know what I mean? There are other positions. And there's probably other positions that Jeremy would want to be or do. So there are other positions in the shadow cabinet than just one. OK, but he wouldn't be in charge of the purse strings if you were in uh, government, if Yvette Cooper was okay, the prime he minister. he be in charge of foreign policy. And that's where his heart lies. So that would be quite a good position for Jeremy to be in, don't you think? That was Dawn Butler uh, speaking to Kay Burley back in 2015. Was that one of the more surreal interviews you took part in over the last four years? I mean, it really was. Um, I mean, I'm so pleased that some of the stuff that was going on in my head didn't come out of my mouth. So, uh, so uh, but, uh, but it's crazy. But it just shows you, though, like how they are programmed to try and trip MPs up all the time or they've got a script that they have to get to or trying to get you to say something. And I just think it's kind of pathetic, really. And do you think it is harder if you're on the left? Yeah, of course, because they're, they're, you know, they're always trying to paint us one way or the other. Um, and yeah, and they get, well, you see it, don't you? Like they give a really easy time to some MPs mm. that don't talk sense. And, uh, and, you know, for, for the rest of us, it's like trying to drill down, you know, so what are you going to do about this? What are you going to But I've already told you. Well, what are you going to do about it? But, I, but I've told you. But refusing to accept it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. But I think that's why we have to build our own media. That's one of the things that you guys are doing here is just so important. Because we have to build our own media and our own narrative. And that way, because I, I, I apply the basic parroting techniques to uh, the media. Mm, I, that's I, interesting. Go on. <clears throat> I do not reward bad behaviour. So, you know, if they tell lies about me or if they're particularly aggressive in any way, then I just don't do the show again. Is that is is that going to be effective, though, for like a leader of the Labour Party? Because obviously, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's getting smeared by every outlet, at every opportunity. He didn't fight back. He should have fought back. You think he should have fought back? Absolutely. One hundred percent. He didn't fight back. If you had journalists camped outside your front door day after day like he did, what would Mm. you do? Uh, Call my brothers. (laughs) <laughs> and, what would, and what would they do remove them <laughs> sort out but nothing we're... else needs to be said <laughs> we'll continue this media conversation but we're going to fast forward now to 2019 so back in 2015 you were taking on Kay Burley now mm. in 2019 it's Carol Malone on the Jeremy mm-hmm. Vine show 
Labour's the only party that's been quite clear and transparent about what we want no, and where we're, where we're going. Have we know have you, have you read, have you, I've, watched, I've watched news reports. No, no, forget about week after week reports. after week, and I've watched your leader change his mind every other week. Not what? true. It is. One minute he's for a customs union, then he's not. No, not One true. minute he's for a no deal, then he's not. It is yeah. true. Not true. Why would your leader not say last week whether he supported a no deal or not? He would not say. He did. He said take no deal off the table. He doesn't support no deal. No, well, he, but then he changes his mind. No, he didn't. And he he's stays quiet. Yes, he has changed his All mind. Right. Don't he changes his mind let's, every let's week. Just because, I, okay, just because but, Carol says he changed his mind, it doesn't mean yeah. that he actually changed we don't, his we're mind. Not, well, in, in fairness, he didn't change his mind. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't change his right. mind. Anyone, Are you Have saying. Have you heard already stop, anywhere? Stop, I'm not going to just be bullied by you, Dawn. Do you think Labour. Do you really believe Labour have been clear on what they believe on Brexit? Because the rest of the country doesn't think so. I'll allow you to bully me. Oh, that, um, that's fully so, your question. So, okay. have you heard or read anywhere that Labour has said, take no deal no, off with the it. Let's not keep going. That was Dawn Butler debating <laughs> Carol Malone on the Jeremy Vine show. What did you think about that one? I mean, bullying. Carol, she accused you of bullying. Carol was just just out of her depth, really, really, wasn't she? I mean, it was just, she, she again, she had her script. Oh, Jeremy said, you know, that he wasn't going to support new, new, no deal. When Jeremy said, take no deal off the table first. I mean, it was our policy. And then later on in the show, she then came clean that she had heard him say that. So it was, again, I find it quite pathetic that they have lines that they're parroting out because mm. they want to get headlines and they want to create a narrative that people pick up on. And we have to fight back more. Us not fighting back, we're just letting them get away with it. And I, and I think we need to fight back more. I mean, I will be a fighting deputy. I mean, a bit like John Prescott, but without the violence. You know I mean? I'm not actually going to punch You're not actually going to punch yeah, someone. Yeah, You'll gonna leave gonna that punch. to your brothers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I never said, I just said they would remove them. But, um, you know, one of them is a boxer there. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I would just... <laughs> but I would... Uh, we, do need to, we do need to fight back, metaphorically. Brilliant. Not physically. Come with the Meghan Markle? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, now we're talking sort of about cantankerous, older white people in the media. The Meghan, the Meghan Markle stuff, precisely, yeah. What would you make of Piers Morgan's fixation with Meghan Markle and what do you think it says about the British media and their relationship to people of colour? Obviously, she's mixed race. Um, I think he's got some kind of unrequited love going on there. Do you know what I mean? I think he's really got a thing for her and... She probably rejected him and he's never gotten over it. Um, I think there's something quite strange uh, in regards to his obsession with her. Um, and I think that his refusal to kind of accept that racism has anything to do with how she um, has been treated is uh, strange for a journalist. Because uh, if you call yourself a journalist, you should be able to see all sides of an argument. Otherwise, you're not a very good journalist. Um, and I have not met one uh, person of colour who doesn't think that racism has something to do with why she left. And I'm really proud of the fact that she said, I'm not going to let all this negativity into my space. And I'm going to remove myself and my child from this environment. And I'm really quite proud of that strong stance. And, you know, you talked about, um, I think you mentioned Andrew earlier on, um, Prince Andrew. Mm. I, I don't know him personally. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, who would want to sit around the dinner table with him? Really? I mean, there's something, you know, if we ignore the fact that at, at best... He is really good friends with a convicted paedophile, then there is something seriously wrong with society. And do you think that Britain is, you know, particularly bad with this stuff? So the United States has had a, a black president. Mm. Well, it's important to say you know, Barack Obama was mixed heritage. People mm. often forget that. Uh, in the UK, we're, we're nowhere near that. And obviously mm. your fight to become deputy leader of the Labour Party is part of that struggle of getting mm. people of colour in, in, into, mm. into positions of public prominence. Do you think Britain is lagging behind the US when it comes to race and politics? I think at the moment, it's becoming um, almost... Uh, it's becoming almost criminal to talk about racism, but not to be a racist. So, I mean, we know Boris Johnson is an actual racist, right, in number 10. But people will be upset for me saying that, but not upset about the things that he has said. 
And it's just a topsy-turvy world when, when you're not focusing on the fact that people are being racist and we need to tackle that. You know, if we want to live in a society that is acceptance, then we have to be honest about what's going on. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, we all have biases. It's how we navigate our way through life with particular biases. You like some things, you don't like some things. Some things because you've had personal experience. You have biases. But, you know, you have to accept that you have biases, and sometimes it's an unconscious bias. And then you have to address through the lens of that bias. So you have to say, right, okay, I, I don't like, I don't like plain crisps, right? Because I think it's a waste of calories. I think I'm going to eat a packet of crisps. It's got to be cheese and onion or something a bit spicy, right? So when I see people eating plain crisps, I mean, why are you eating plain crisps? And it kind of irritates me because my office eats plain crisps a lot. And I'm like, why are you wasting all those calories? That's just my own particular thing. I've got to get over that. You understand? <laughs> so it's like people have various I mean, biases. Kind of yeah. People have various biases, you know, and you just have to accept that. Do you think it's getting and, worse? And don't fight against it. Don't say, I haven't got a bias. I, I like all crisps. No, you don't. Do you think it's getting worse, though? I mean, because you've obviously been in politics as an activist moving up the last 20 years. Mm. Do you think it's going backwards? Yes, I do. And I think uh, social media has a lot to play with it. I think the abuse, not I think, I know, the abuse is just outrageous and appalling. And you have to... You, you have to also realise that people are being so abusive online to politicians, all that disrespect to politicians. My friend got murdered, right? This is what it leads to. We've got a huge rise of the far right in this country. It's the biggest threat to security in this country, mm. and we're not talking about it. And mm. it's actually so serious, and we have to address it. And then it filters down, and you've got young people being bullied. You've got mental health issues at an all-term high. You've got suicides at an all-term high. Um, and that is because of the, bu the abuse, mainly online, that's filtering down. And we have to do something about it, and we have to stand up to it. It does feel like it's getting a lot, a lot worse. Like, it was what, 25 years ago, Eric Cantona kicked a football hooligan in Crystal Palace, you know, in mm. South East London. And very quickly, people said, oh, well, actually, the football fan was being xenophobic. He was a mm. racist, BNP supporter good for Eric Cantona and I feel like if that happened today mm. that wouldn't be the response mm. people would be like get him out you know this is you know that, that guy's freedom of speech he can say mm. what he likes and you think wow we've really gone backwards in the last uh, 25 years exactly and again um, even though I don't normally like to talk about left right but the, the right wing media so if you if you take woke for instance you know the new young terminology of woke woke just means being respectful people, being awake to what's out there, being awake that if you are a white man that you have privilege and how you use that privilege is important. And then all of a sudden the right wing media is saying, woke is really bad and you don't know I mean, who wants anybody who's woke? So now it's really bad to be respectful of others. Now it's really bad to be considerate of others. When is that okay? When has that become okay? When has that become the norm? Yeah. Don't be an arsehole, basically. Don't and, be and, an arsehole. And, and now the right wing thing is, I'm going to be an arsehole. Yeah, exactly. And that's really good. Yeah. And it's like, that, and that is, and that's also the consequence of Trump and Johnson together. And so um, Edward Burke said that when, uh, when bad men unite, I might get this wrong way around now, we have to, good people have to combine. And I just think good people around the world has to combine. And we have to use social media for good in that way. Let's talk about the specifics of the deputy leadership as a position. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, first question, how would you differ from the last occupant of the role? <laughs> <laughs> do you think, do, how, how do you think he performed in general, the last occupant, Tom Watson? Are you impressed by his tenure? Tenure? Yeah? I don't know. Was a, was a, okay, so I would be... Um, I would be complete. This is like Dawn seriously delaying responding to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I would be completely different to the last incumbent of deputy leader. Mm -hmm. I would be a uh, unifying figure. Um, I will be. Um, I will be loyal to the leader, whoever that leader maybe. And I mean, I have been loyal. I've served under two Labour Prime Ministers. You know, as a minister in Gordon Brown's cabinet, I've been loyal to each and every Prime Minister, and I will be loyal again to the Labour 
leader, whoever that is. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. It's a vital component of the role. And what do you think makes you stand out from the other candidates this time around? Um... Because, you know, lots of people are saying kind of in the leadership election, the deputy leadership, actually, there's a bit more variation. But mm. uh, lots of them are talking the same talk about unifying the party and getting the grassroots organized, you know, like. Because what, they're copying a lot of stuff that I said. It, that's why. It, you you know, did it first. As 10 weeks goes on, I think everyone's going to be sort of taking bits of everybody else's speeches, to be honest. But um, but my core strategy was there from the very beginning, as soon as I spoke. But um, but I've, I don't just talk the talk. I walk the walk. If you look at what I've done. I've always been loyal and I've always had the party's interest at heart because I want to get back into government. I've been in government. None of, none of the other candidates, um, the leader or deputy leader, have actually been a minister in government. Mm. I have. And I can tell you there's nothing sweeter than being in government and I want to be back in there again. So mm. I've got, that is my focus. How do we get into government? And I want to keep the policies that we've got. Without Jeremy, we would not have had our manifestos that we had in 2017 and 2019. So it's really vital that we keep those policies. In the next three years, because I think there could be an election in three years, the next three years, we go around the country and we explain our manifesto. We say, look, this is what this meant because we didn't have enough time. You know, I call it the Toby Carvery manifesto. I'm not sponsored by Toby Carvery in any way. They haven't fed my team in any way, but if they want to, I'm quite happy for them to. But um, I call it the Toby Carvery manifesto. Because like meat keeps turning you know, yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of it you start to doubt whether you actually like the restaurant and it, and it was just too much it was just too much and you're like just wait 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 I haven't finished but no we're pouring more stuff on your plate and then you know I'm, you know, I'm smothering it in gravy and like I don't yeah. want any gravy doing I'm like but you're gonna have some it was just too much and we need to just take our time and take it in small digestible chunks so people can just absorb what it is that we're saying and selling and then move on when they're ready to some potatoes and carrots and Brussels sprouts. Some specific things, Richard Bergen and Rebecca Long Bailey now actually have both come out in favour of open selections. Mm-hmm. So the idea that every candidate or every MP will have to face an open you know, selection where other candidates can stand against them to be uh, the Labour candidate at the next year. I said candidate way too many times mm-hmm. in that sentence. But <laughs> in any case, do you back open selections? So I'm working through this proposal of open selections. So the trigger ballot was kind of a halfway house. Yep. But what it didn't do is tackle the issue of candidates being imposed on local members or local members not having a big enough say in what their MPs are doing. You know, some MPs not turning up to GC meetings and things like that, um, which is alien to me because I'm always at my GC meeting. So the trigger ballot didn't tackle those issues. So we have to find a way to tackle those issues. So I'm not opposed to open selections. I just would need to establish how exactly it would work. And I haven't quite got to the detail of that yet. I'm a very much, as I said, mm-hmm. like a detailed person. I like to see how that actually works in practice. So it will work. I don't want to just say things, you know, just to tick a box. I want to know, right, okay, well, how is that actually going to work in reality? So I need to know how that's going to work in mm-hmm. reality. So I haven't quite figured it out, but I'm not opposed to it. And I understand the problems and the issues. And also, you know, I'm, I'm mindful that the trigger ballot uh, lots of people who were triggered were uh, black, Asian minority, ethnic MPs. They were the ones that were triggered and women were triggered disproportionately. Mm-hmm. So I'm very mindful of that. And so it's like, how do we have a policy that works, but it doesn't kind of add to some of the discrimination that currently happens? One other difference uh, in, in the deputy leadership field was the 10 pledges that the Board of Deputies demanded. So mm-hmm. as far as I understand it, neither you nor Richard Bergen have committed to adopting them all. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the leadership candidates have. Mm-hmm. I wondered if you could talk a bit about your decision to mm-hmm. to not adopt those. Yeah. So again, it's about process for me um, because I'm, I'm, I'm adamant that whatever I do, if there are structural barriers, if there are structural barriers to discrimination or structural barriers to progress, that I dismantle those structural barriers. And the Board of Deputies pledges, there were some questions around there that I, that I need answers to. So I've written to the Board of Deputies for a meeting, haven't got a meeting date yet. Um, but also, everybody was adamant last year that the EHRC had to be respected and the recommendations had to be implemented. And I agreed with that. And they haven't reported yet. They were supposed to report January. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to report next month. But I think it's important that we see what the the Equality and Human Rights Commission reports, that we implement those recommendations, and then we look at if there are any gaps in our procedures and policies, um, and then we look at how we address those. 
I think there's lots of things that parties doing at the moment. Like we've got a fast track system. Mm -hmm. And I think that fast track system has to be normalized. So it's the thing that we do all the time. So you suspend people first and then you yeah, investigate. Two years is just a bit too long yeah. for anyone, oh isn't it? Oh my God, it? yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I mean, we got it wrong. I mean, the party got it wrong. They, they dragged their feet and they got it wrong. But now we have to get it right. And so I'm not really into um, tick boxing. You know, people kind of tick a box and think, job done, done mm. it. That doesn't help me. That doesn't that doesn't dismantle any of the structural barriers. I want to make sure that anybody's discriminated against, whether it be whether you're Jewish, uh, whether you're black, whether you're you know Irish, whether you are disabled, whether you are LGBTQI plus, that this procedure works for everybody. So we are an accepting party of everybody, and we're welcoming and we're respectful, and so it has to work, and that's why. I'm putting my cards on the table. I, I agree with you on this question. We talked about it on a on a show a couple of weeks ago. Mm. I mean, there, there were some of the pledges that I thought were a bit. Or do you know the idea that if you uh, support a if you support a suspended member, then you yourself should be suspended? Which to me just seems like a, a very odd rule that you know well, doesn't seem fair to me in any case. It's, but a, joint, it's a joint enterprise type. Yeah, uh, exactly. Rule. Yeah. But my my question to you, I suppose, was like, what's the pressure been like? Because obviously, obviously, all the leaders felt a lot of yeah. pressure to say whether or not they had scrutinized these rules and you know you, know, you got the yeah. impression that they hadn't actually thought oh these are actually a really good idea so i'm going to adopt them they felt sort of like if i don't adopt these you know i'm going to get trashed as yeah as someone who doesn't care about this issue like did you feel a lot of pressure about a lot that? of pressure it was really hard um and actually it's still hard because every day you're getting somebody you know people have written me handwritten letters um i've had people telling other people to come and talk to me and just telling me just sign it just sign it and it'll all go away and mm. i'm like but it won't go away because we would not have dealt with racism. We would have just dealt with ticking a box. And actually, dealing with racism is too important to me to just tick a box. Mm -hmm. And so the pressure is immense and it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and no way am I telling any Jewish person that I know better. What I'm saying is I want the procedure to work and to work for you and to work for anyone. And I, I tell you the other thing which I haven't really said publicly, but um, I'll say it here. You've got some candidates saying, I want to see every single case on my desk on Monday morning. Well, number one, I don't want to see every single case on my desk on Monday morning. Uh, because if I did, then I would also need to see all the other cases and then I'll become a caseworker, and not deputy leader. Number two... That is not an independent system. That is an interference system. You are interfering with a system. Number three, and it's what we were talking about earlier, it's a bias. You are then injecting another layer of bias into a system, which is unacceptable. You cannot put your own biases in a disciplinary system. It doesn't work. And so I completely disagree with the candidates that are saying that. Who have said, what, what kind of said they want their actual cases? Because I know that... Tom Watson had said that. I mean, that's, yeah, that's he said record, right? and, I, and I disagreed with Tom at, on that. As, and I told him that. Mm. And I said that in the meeting. That it was wrong. Because it just... For me, it's... Um, uh, it's a sort of a knee-jerk, immature way mm. of, of dealing with something without thinking through uh, the consequences of that. Yeah. Because otherwise you're producing a hierarchy also of discrimination. Yeah. Well, you, you have to look at these cases, but not these cases. Yeah. They can go through the normal slow process. Yeah. And how's that fair? Um, is it a problem for you that Keir Starmer is the favourite? Now, I ask this in the sense that he's, you know, uh, the election defeat, what, however you explain it, one problem that Labour had was seats outside of London. Mm -hmm. Keir Starmer has a seat in central London. Mm -hmm. You have a seat in central London. Do you think that people will think if the leader is from London, we can't really have a deputy from London? I think, you know, I think people should just vote for me because I'm the best person to do the deputy leadership job. And um, I've traveled all around the country uh, and I traveled during the election all around the country and people like me. So, <laughs> so it'll be fine. And I can unite people uh, all ends of the country. And actually, I don't want to be people's voice. I want to amplify the voices of people. There's a huge difference in that. So I will just turn up the volume uh, and I will ensure that there's structures in place in every area, my core strategy, and that will be implemented in every area. So everybody will feel that they are a part and have a say in everything that the party does. So our producer Fox is saying it should not be called CORD, but CODA strategy. 
Coda. Coda. C. C- uh, what, what's, I forgot what the C was again. Uh, campaign. Campaign, organize, okay. discipline, educate, recruit. Coda, Coda. I quite like Coda being a programmer. Because you were a Coda. Oh, yeah, I was a Coda. Yeah, I quite, maybe that's yeah, why yeah, you yeah. It. I quite like that. Oh my god! But I printed all my leaflets now. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Uh, we're going to start taking your questions. So start putting those in the comments or tweeting them on the hashtag mm. Tisky Sour. Um, while I'm collecting those, Aaron, you got anything else you want to want to bring that's up? Very well, impressive. Very impressive. I, I think the stuff about the uh, the board of deputies ten asks the thing as well about I want them all on my desk. I mean that I think that breaches GDPR, right? Because you have a data controller, and the deputy leader of the Labour Party is not the data controller, and it kind of it may be illegal. I mean that small hurdle of something being illegal, but also giving it to people outside of the Labour Party mm. who are not uh, even affiliated to the Labour Party. Mm. Uh, has issues and also remember if you do it for one you need to do it for all yeah so you have to do it for every single group otherwise you don't have a fair process and i'm very much about having a fair i get process. i get kind of worried actually about how how dismissive people are about basic tenets of justice mm. so like equality under the law i mean i thought that was a thing mm. or you know for instance there was a member who was suspended and then one of the character references for him was clive lewis and people say, oh, Clive Lewis is an apologist for X. And he said, the, the person has a right to a character reference. Mm. Anybody who's had a brush with the law, no matter how minor, knows these things are important. Mm. And yet, uh, and yeah, just gets sort of dismissed as unimportant. All right, we've got some comments on the, on the Twitter. Yeah. Uh, Carl Barks is a fan. Dawn mm. is seriously smashing it on Tisky, Tisky Sour. <laughs> She's got my first preference locked in, Woo-hoo, TBH. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Joseph Hardy. I'm minded to vote for Dawn for deputy. She's passionate, likable, loyal. But someone I was talking to wasn't. Oh, because of her role in Brown Blair government. Could you ask her to talk about that as I'm under-informed on it? Oh, interesting. I, th- I thought I was just reading out a comment, but it's also a question, <laughs> which is that, as you say, you sort of, you, you hold it as a strength, mm. you know, that you served under the Blair-Brown government mm. and then under the Corbyn leadership. Mm. But I mean, in terms of, you know, your politics, what did you think of, of n- the new Labour governments, of that legacy, that record? So when it was time for uh, Tony to go, uh, there was another kind of coup at hand and letter writing and, you know, they wanted us to sign up to a letter and for it to go public and all this stuff. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I marched against the war in Manchester, in London. Um, but I said, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and see Tony and say, look, you know what, you need to go. And I did. I went and saw him and said, look, you, need, you know, you need to go. Um, and that's the way I deal with things. And I mean, it's important, like Labour in government, is, is way better than the Tories. You know, we did a lot of good things. You know, not everything was good, and actually some of it was, you know, unforgivable. But don't forget the good things uh, that Labour has done in government. And we shouldn't let people undo that, because for too often, the Tories always undo mm. our good stuff, and not just to undo it. They take credit for things that we've done. So we need to start owning what we did well. Um, so I, and I'm, I was the minister for young citizens and youth engagement under Gordon Brown. I engaged hundreds and thousands of young people, like properly, not like a Trump kind of engagement. I did like proper engagement. Um, what I, does that mean? Sorry, what it, is- it means that I it was it's real. So I did uh, reach out sessions. I made sure that we had youth centres. We had funded protected funding for young people. I was chair of the party for young people. I was the one that introduced the one pound rate for young people so they could join the mm. party. So, they, so that money wasn't a barrier to them joining the party. I did a lot of good things uh, when I was in government, and I I want to do it again. This is a good question, which is related. Chris Jarvis, who also dropped us a fiver in the Super Chat. Thank you very much. Those are always welcome. Uh, What was the best thing Tony Blair did as leader? And what was the worst mistake Jeremy Corbyn made? Oh, wow. So uh, I think one of the best things um, has to be minimum wage because I was a trade union official. And... um, and I, I used to actually sneak in the boot of the cars to go into workplaces because we weren't allowed to, to oh, go wow. in. And so I'd sneak in the boot of the car, I'd get into the workplace, and I'd sit like a, in a corner in the canteen and people would come and see me and I'd sign them up and talk to them about trade unions. Um, and, uh, and, you know, people were really, really poorly paid. And then Labour came in and introduced the minimum wage and it was like, boom, people had like a pay rise just like that. Mm. It was just phenomenal to see the difference straight away uh, the Labour government can make. So I think that was a good thing. What was the biggest mistake that Jeremy made? 
not fighting back. Mm. You know, I'm like, a, he really needed to have sort of stood his ground and fought back and say, I have stood up to racism, you know, all of my life and tell people his story of, you know, what he did and why he did it. You know, because people didn't know that and he allowed a narrative to run away with him and and, and it really bruised him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He, he almost became paralyzed with the whole thing and so he couldn't... He, he couldn't got flawed by it. Yeah, really, didn't he, he couldn't cope with it. And it was sad, really. Very oh. sad. Can I, what yeah. one... To be provocative, what one lesson could to, um, Tony Blair teach Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party? What thing do you think, you know, Corbyn could have learnt off Blair? <laughs> I'm open to ideas. No, I think there's a few, but, you know, I'd be interested in your sort of, you've obviously worked alongside both people. I have some really good advisors. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that was good. That was a little Sorry. exclusive there. But I didn't mean, I, I, like, I just mean, like... No, that's really like, insightful. Like, I just mean, like, attack, like, because he didn't fight back. And I just think if he had, I mean, everyone tried. I'm not saying mm. they didn't try, but I just, yeah. Did you call I out just, with the advisors? No. No? No, I never felt do you, out do you th anyone. Okay, so, okay. But, but I mean, I, I, mean, I argue. Because I mean, Emily Formby sort of, when she was pitching for the MPs, she sort of launched a, a bit of an attack on Jeremy Corbyn's advice. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, I don't mean it in that way. I just mean there was, like, you, lots of he things. He needed an Alistair Campbell. Yeah, you know, lots of things that could have been done, lots of things that I feel could have been done better. Um, Do you think that's because you know. Tony Blair was more sort of intellectually confident so he could say, you know what, I'm not good at this, you're good at that. And he, he sought to get the best of the best, whereas Jeremy Corbyn didn't necessarily do that. Is that what you would say? Or? No, I mean, I think the, the flip side of it is they were all about PR and Jeremy's all very genuine. Right. And so I think that's the flip side of it. But I just think, I just think, yeah, we just needed, we just needed more, and we needed a, a wider pool. And I just think that, you know, I also think we could have brought more people into the tent. Yeah. Um, and and that would have helped. I guess I I agree with that. But then I, cause the counter the counterfactual is, you know, there was the coup in 2016. People after yeah, that yeah. privileged, you know, loyalty over necessarily, you know, mm. who's got the best CV, and that was entirely understandable. Yeah, yeah, of course. But I just think. I mean, I'm, as a, that's why I'm so angry about the coup. Mm. But I, I just think I just really, you know, I would have forced Jeremy to fight back. Of the candidates for leader, who do you think's got the most capacity to fight back when the media attack them? Because I mean, also we need to be clear: it's not you know people pretend that Keir Starmer won't get attacked. Whoever becomes the leader, oh, unless they adopt Tony Blair style policies, they're going to get attacked. Who do you but think even, is going to be the I best? Mean, even, even Tony got attacked. So, like, everybody, every Labour leader will get attacked for something. To a something. different extent, though, right? Yeah, of course. But, like, every, le every Labour leader will get attacked. I mean, Jeremy was ferocious over... It was a sustained attack over four years. Mm. And it was an unjustified attack uh, the majority of the time. So, it was outrageous. Um, but... Uh, what do you think? you think? You think they've all got the metal to fight back? Do you think any of them need a little bit of a sort of like pep talk? No, I think they will all fight back in their different ways. Yeah? Yeah, so some will have like, um, I, I'm sure like more subtle, some will be more uh, punch them out. I mean... Who's going to do the punch in Lisa? No, I think... Who's going to be I the think, subtle? I think Keir? Emily's a puncher. Emily's she? a puncher, yeah. Emily's, Emily's a puncher. I think um, I think Rebecca is uh, Rebecca is the the cutting one. Do you know what I mean? Like she would kind of like smoothly cut you down, kind of thing. So mm. I think that would be kind of you know nice to kind of like you're not you sing. don't you're not even sure if she's attacking you or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. You go home and you think about it, and then also you wake up in the night and think, oh my god, <laughs> she said that about me. So I think that'd be quite good. So that'd be quite fun. To what about Keir? Did he hone Keir, in on the detail? I think or? yeah, Keir's a, Keir's a detail man. So Keir will like baffle you with the science of it and just like yeah just just you cannot like there was some, so this is really funny um so well i think it's funny you might not but anyway <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh who was it was it rob dominic rob got up in parliament and said something about kia um that he was in a meeting and he didn't know his stuff and then kia sat there and it was like it was just going through like the machinery of his brain and he was, and he was like hang on a minute yes i did that's not true <laughs> and then he was like point of order and then he got up and he just like 
floored Rob. And then Rob had to get up and apologize. So, you know, it's kind of, it'll be kind of like that, I think. I thought it was quite funny. I saw one of these focus groups, which I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure of, but it was an interesting focus group. And one of the respondents, they were all sort of Labour, Labour floating voters. Mm. And one of them said when they saw Starmer, he reminds me of David Cameron. Mm. And I was like, is that good or bad? And yeah. it was a genuine mm. question because yeah. obviously Cameron, he was a prime minister, yeah. you know, th- th- he yeah. was a, a pro- one of the Cameron's traits was he looked like he was the prime minister. That's basically all he had going for him. So I was like, well, okay. On the other hand, in an era of sort of political polarization, people being tired of politicians who look like bank managers, there's no effect. I'm not trying to be dismissive or, you know, antagonistic towards Keir Starmer. He's just very well turned out, very well, bank groomed, managers, very well polished. Yeah. It's a good thing. It's fine. Um, do, do you think that Keir Starmer would have to work on not looking like a formulaic politician, given the misgivings people now have around, around politicians? I mean, what, Boris Johnson is prime minister, yeah, right? Exactly. We had Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the opposition for four years. Or, or do you think that's something that could actually be a strength for him, looking like a prime minister? Well, the thing is, I love the fact that people liked Jeremy for who he was. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like he didn't have to pretend to look a certain way. And I really loved and respected that because I just think it's nice when you accept people in the, as their authentic selves. Mm. I think if you try and change somebody, I don't know, I think you'll see through it. Do you know what I mean? If you wear a T-shirt and you're not used to wearing a T-shirt, you look a bit odd. Or, you know, some people who wear jeans that they haven't worn for years and you think, you know, those jeans don't look that great. Mm. You know, so I think, you know, you kind of have to, 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 to be comfortable in who you are and own it. Um, so people just have to be who they are and own it. So I think you'd be a good mix with Starmer, right? Because I think that's where he's very weak, personally. Just my, you know, look, we've still got 10 weeks to go. He doesn't necessarily shine. He needs to show he can fight, doesn't he? Yeah, he's very competent. You know, when you gave the answer about with Jeremy Corbyn, what would you give, give him out of 10? And he gave a really classy answer. Mm, mm. And you don't, you don't always see that side of him, like, really, you know, just really cutting through and, yeah. Oh, Ian Guffrey. Why did you vote against investigating the Iraq war? Um, because we still had troops fighting. And my brother was at the army. And um, I actually spoke to him and said, like, how would you feel if we said you were fighting a, you know, an irrelevant or an illegal war whilst you're out fighting for your country? And it would be an but insult. But you can still criticise the troops, can't you, in there? Well, no, you can, no. sorry, you can criticise the war without criticising the troops. Sorry, I said completely yeah. the opposite thing to what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but no, I, I, I just don't think that was the right thing to do. And I'd said at the time that the investigation has to happen, but when our troops are home safe and sound, and, you know, when we're treating them with respect rather than, you know, saying that they're fighting a war that they shouldn't be fighting, which I didn't think they should, but... Lots of people asking about Scotland. That's become a bit of an issue in, in uh, the leadership election, especially. I'm not sure how much in the deputy, but what, what do you think about a Scottish referendum? You know, if, if the SNP win a majority in next year's uh, assembly elections, is it but, called the assembly? No, it's Scottish Parliament, isn't it? Yeah, if, if, so if, if they win a majority, then do they have a mandate to have a second Scottish independence referendum? I think we need to learn from referendums and go in against what people have decided they wanted. So I think if, uh, if, if they want it, they can if have they it. Want it then Labour needs to be a party why, why, of democracy again. Why, why would you stop it? Do you know what I mean? I think if they, you know. Proportional representation? So I think we need to have a debate around that. I mean, there are different methods. Um, I think we need to keep the constituency link uh, between MPs and the constituency. And so we need to have a debate about if we change our democracy, what we look like. I think we have the most right wing, not think, we have the most right-wing government that we've ever had. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are taking serious leaves out of um, Trump's playbook. They are trying to suppress democracy. Bringing voter ID to vote is suppressing democracy. And so I think we are going to almost be forced to have a debate about how we, um, how we expand and improve our democracy. We're coming up to an hour, so we're going to finish with a quick fire round. Oh, oh my so God. We want, we want quick fire Let answers. Let me sit up. <laughs> Hang on. First question. Who do you want to be the next American president? Quick fire, come on. I don't know. Come on. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know, I can't say. All right, Ber- B- Bernie or Biden? I don't think I like Biden. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not sure, okay, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, as long as they're a Democrat. When you relax in front of the TV, do you turn on Netflix or iPlayer? Netflix. <laughs> I don't have iPlayer. <laughs> you look, te- you look te- I'm, I'm like, I don't have iPlayer. You don't have iPlayer? <laughs> Who should be the next James Bond? Idris. Wine or beer? 
Wein. Kobin Oblei. <laughs> Have you taken recreational drugs? No. Well, I'm from East London. I've inhaled, but I haven't taken drugs. But I've been in a room full of drugs and hot box. Hot box. You like the hot box? The hot box is if you're in a room full of. It's not like a oh, car. Is it? Well, it could be a car. I Traditionally, I suppose it would be a car, but it could also be a small room. So oh, I've if, not if, been in a car, but I've been in some serious raves. Okay. Uh, should should drugs should be beans. Should, should, beans, actually. should drugs be legalized? Oh, we definitely have to have a debate around drugs and sex. I mean, the two things that MPs hate talking about, and they do a lot of. Oh, so you, you, would you legalize sex work as well? I think we have to have de- a serious. It's, it's not. So it's, not- it's, not we, it's decriminalization, but I think yeah, we have to have a serious debate around drugs and sex. Rebecca Longbelly or Keir Starmer? I will work with anybody who's elected. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> You, <laughs> oh, we, thought, we thought we were going to have you there. Uh, and there's two others. You've got Lisa and Emily in that. Yeah, that's true. It's just because these are the two favourites, aren't they? <laughs> well, we were debating about Netflix, iPlayer and Amazon Prime. So we were going for the easy, the easy binaries. Uh, no. I, had, um, I think I had Amazon Prime. No, I had the stick. And that was really rubbish. But anyway, yeah. Succession. Do you watch Succession? No. Really good. That's an Amazon Prime. Oh, is it? Really good. Oh, wow. Okay. Something else to watch when I can't sleep. <laughs> are you losing sleep in this election yeah honestly the there's just so much well it's not really the str- it's just so much to do and going on and like i i was trying to get us uh you know into government so i wasn't planning a deputy leadership campaign or anything so you didn't announce that beforehand actually, did you yeah but that was the difference between announcing and planning yeah that was just like tom you know tom stood down who do you think should do it yeah. well actually i think i'd be quite good at it you know it was that kind of thing so i didn't I can really, improve on that guy yeah, <laughs> So, so I did. Uh, so I did. So I did Have you bought the book? Actually, I did black, you book? oh, downsizing. Yeah, it's been advertised every time. Like you get a Christmas card or something. It's Tom has got his book on the other side. Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. I'm what happened with that? I he was going to become a personal day. trainer. Now he's a lord. It lasted like two weeks. <laughs> I'm sure he can be a personal there trainer. There is a gym in, in, the, in the estate, isn't there? Awful. He could be a personal trainer was, in Westminster Gym. It's awful though that gym. But um, yeah, no, well, what can you say? In any case, <laughs> in we've, any we've, case. we've come to our hour. I did actually have one more question. Yeah, go on. She was saying about, you know, sleeping and what you watch. How do you oh, relax? Oh, yeah, yeah, sleeping. How do you relax? That's it. I was uh, talking about, uh, see, there's so much to do. That's right, because I hadn't, I hadn't planned. So the, mine is a grassroots campaign. You know, somebody felt so sorry for me with my leaflets. Mm. This is a true <laughs> It's a true story. Your core leaflet. So, no, so we had this. So we had this leaflet that's basically bits of paper, and um, and everyone's got all this flashy, you know, glossy leaflet. And somebody felt so sorry for me that they gave me two grand to help to oh. help to help us. Uh, well, produce what are the other candidates? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Come on. So how do you relax? <laughs> how do I relax? Mm. Uh, so you know, with the wine or vodka, my third drink is secondary vodka. smoke. It sounds vodka. Like as well. No, no, I haven't been to a Shabin for a long time, <laughs> uh, but I do like to party. Uh, I do like to dance. Uh, I do like a rave, um, salsa dancing. Um, yeah, all that kind. You of have stuff. a Jamaica party, don't you? Every year at conference. Yeah, have you been? Have I haven't you been, been actually. I'll come to the next have you been? one. I've been there a couple of times. This is when you were saying I bring people together. I know this for a fact because when I go to Dawn Butler's parties, I get started on, and people shake my hand. <laughs> so she's bringing the whole party together. Cross factional. Seriously, I am bringing the party together. I re- and like the party and party. Yeah, that no, was really fun. Yeah, it was really fun this year as well. See? That could have been your that could have been your slogan actually. Bring, Dawn Butler bringing, bringing the, the party, party together. Together. Uh, because there's still time. We've got ten weeks. Oh, that could be it. Yeah, yeah we'll print you some new flies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dawn Butler, you <laughs> thank you so much for joining on this evening it's on Tiski Sour. It's a pleasure. Um, if any of the other deputy leadership candidates are watching, you're, you're also welcome to come on our show. We yeah, want to get all, f- all f- five? Five? Five. Is there five of us? I think there's five. I don't even know. Yeah, there's five of us. Yeah, five. Uh, Aaron Bastani, thank you as ever. Always a pleasure. My pleasure. It was great to have Dawn on. Fantastic. Pleasure. Uh, you've been watching Tiski Sour. Good evening. Oh, actually, first of all, we do have a show tomorrow. It'll be with Omar Bugatti, who, uh, Bargutti, sorry, not Bugatti, who was the, a founding member of Boycott, Divest and Sanctions. Very relevant uh, in this, you know, in this moment when Donald Trump has just announced what's well, called a peace plan, mm-hmm. but it's got nothing to do with peace. In any case, tune in to that tomorrow at 8 p.m. Uh, that's it for us. Good night. Mm-hmm.